most gracious and heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the gifts that you give us in our lives. Today, we thank you for our mothers who gave us life. Lord, we ask now that eyes would be open to see your hand at work about us, ears be open to hear your word, hearts be open to receive and embrace it. Come, Holy Spirit, take over the service and kindle in us the fire of your love. We pray these things in the precious name of your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning. It is wonderful to see you in the house of the Lord today where we truly do worship our Lord and Savior, the risen King Jesus, and He is glad that you are here with us. Today we celebrate mothers. We give thanks to our mothers. Sometimes we look and say, well, it's Mother's Day, and we look at and think about our mothers who are either with us or have gone on and Remember that they're the ones who gave us life. They're the ones who brought new life into us and brought us into this world. So without moms, we wouldn't be here. Isn't that true? So we want to honor them. Now sometimes my mom says, I wonder why I gave you birth. (laughs) But we all know that mothers love their children. And probably they love them more unconditionally than their dads do. I mean, it's really true. I remember, everybody's heard the expression, right? Wait till your father gets home. (laughs) Come on, you know that saying. Doesn't matter whether you're a son or a daughter. It's like, wait till your dad gets home. And no matter what you did, though, at the end, your mom, hopefully, you know, came. And even though you were in trouble, she forgave you. That's what a mother's love is about. Mothering Day was founded in the 1600s. It's called Mothering Day in England. And I just want to share some information that I gathered because we do it on the second Sunday in May. It's always the second Sunday in May. It was given a proclamation and um, was given, I think, by Woodrow Wilson at that time. Of, uh, it, was, it was declared Mother's Day as the second uh, Sunday in May. But did you know that in Norway, it's the second Sunday in February? That in Miramar, it's on the first moon, full moon, in January. In Sweden, it is the last, and in France, it's the last Sunday in May, unless it's Pentecost Sunday, and then they move it to the first Sunday in June. It's kind of like one of those movable feasts that we have in the church. In Ireland and the UK and Nigeria, it's on the fourth Sunday of Lent. So two weeks ago, they celebrated Mother's Day or Mothering Day as they call it. And in South Korea, they call it Parents' Day, honoring all the parents. But the point is, is no matter what day it is, there's a day to honor our mothers. We honor them because of their love for us. And I think that's something we can see in our gospel today. It is about Jesus' love for his disciples. He said, you did not choose me, I chose you. And he also says in our gospel today, he says, there is no greater gift than a man to lay down his life for his friends. And I think we need to take a look at a couple pieces of this scripture because until we do, until we grasp it, until we bring it into our hearts, we won't fully understand what's going on. Because Jesus also calls him friend, no longer a servant. But we need to talk about God's love because it's all founded on that. God so loved the world that he sent his one and only begotten son to the end that All that believe should not perish, but have everlasting life. We read that, we know that scripture, don't we? John 3, 16. But we should also read verse 17, which says, He came into the world not to condemn it, but to save it. In other words, we have a choice. Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn it. He came and said, hey, come along with me. Come be with me. You have that opportunity. We're the ones who condemn ourselves when we place our faith in some other religions or philosophies or in our own good works. Because that's not what it's about. It's about our faith in Christ and about what God did for us through His Son 
that he came and reconciled us to him. That we are reconciled, that we are a new creation, that we become his ambassadors to share his grace, his love, and his mercy in the world today. It's about God's love for us that he loved us so much that he sent his son. It's a way that Jesus says, you know, I love you unconditionally. Now you have to realize that during the time in which Jesus is sharing this passage, it's still at the Last Supper. It's still at a time in which he is sharing, he's already washed the disciples' feet. He's giving them last instructions, basically. And he's saying that about his love for them. It's an unconditional love. He's saying, in a few short hours, in a few short hours, I'm going to be captured. They'll arrest me. They will take me away. They will inquire of me as to who I am. They will turn me over to the Romans. I will be lashed. My skin, my flesh will be torn apart. I will carry that cross to the hill. And while I'm being crucified, I'll say forgive them, for they know not what they do. You see, this is the love that he's sharing with them. Greater love hath no man than he lay down his life for him. Because Jesus wants us to know. Jesus wants us to understand what he's going to go through so that we could be with him. So that we could share with him in the glory of eternal life. But more important, so that we know the message in which to carry forward. The message in which we can carry to the world. About his love for the world. About his love for the people. I remember when I was young, there's always times when your parents get mad at you, aren't they? In there? And most of the time when they do, you really remember, you're reminded of what your middle name is, aren't you? (laughs) My mom would say, David, George. I'm like, oh Lord, how far can I run? (laughs) But you see, Jesus understands our frailties. He understands who we are. Peter, when he recognized that Jesus was the Christ, and he made that confession, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah. And then Jesus tells him, well, you got that not from man, but from the revelation that God gave you about who I am. And then he goes on to tell them at that point, because they understand who he is, that he is the Messiah, and he starts laying out what's going to happen to him. And then Peter says, no, 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 no. That's not. It's not the way it should be. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You remember that passage? But he's not calling Peter Satan. He's telling Peter, it's not about you. It's about what I'm doing for you. It's not about what you want me to do. It's about what I've been sent here to do to give you that unconditional love so that you, no matter where you've been, what you've done, what you've seen, what you've experienced, that you can come be with me. To take away the separation that you currently have with God. And then empower you with the Holy Spirit to carry it forward. I love what he says about, you are no longer my servant, you are my friends. Now, you think about that. A friend. There's a difference between friends and acquaintances, aren't there? A friend, as somebody reminded me one time, is if you open up your address book... Or your contacts in your phone, which my phone company dumped on me yesterday when I upgraded their system and I spent five hours not riding a motorcycle correcting it. (laughs) I needed to share Jesus' love with them at that time. (laughs) I got all my contacts back. And they were kind enough to say, make sure you've got them all. I don't have that kind of photographic memory, but the important ones were there. 
Because if we look in our address book or we look in our contacts in our phone, who are the people that you could call? And they would be there for you in a moment. They would drop everything. A friend is somebody that you share with. You're going through a tough time. You don't go up to somebody in Walmart and say, Can I talk to you for a minute? <laughs> They'll look at you like, You're crazy. Go away. But a friend is somebody who says, Yeah, I've got time for you. Share with me. When something joyful happens in your life, who do you call? A friend. Those are what true friends are about. If you have a plan where you're going to go somewhere or do something, you share that with a friend. A friend is somebody who can count on you and you can count on them. A friend is somebody who will help walk you through the trials and tribulations, the joys that you go through. A friend is just somebody who's there. And those are true friends. Jesus says, I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know what the master's doing. But I call you friend. Because Jesus shared exactly what was going to happen. He shared with them. And they had to understand that this is what God's purpose was. And allow Him to go through it. As much as it would cause them pain. In the end, Peter denied Him three times. They all ran away in the Garden of Gethsemane. But as we read later in the Acts chapter 10, we see of Jesus' great love because he didn't hold it against them. After he rose from the dead, he ate with them, he talked with them, he walked with them so that those who had witnessed everything would have a firmer foundation in understanding who he is. This is God's love for us. This is Jesus' love. I no longer call you servants, I call you friends because I've laid this out for you. And you can see. And I'm entrusting you. A friend is somebody that you can entrust if they say they're going to do something that they'll do it for you. Isn't that true? But an acquaintance, eh. Acquaintance is going, da 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 da. You know them, don't you? I really look at Acts chapter 10. And we only read a small portion of it. But I think we need to have that foundation because this really shows how much of a friend and trusted person that Peter was. It wasn't about excluding the Gentiles, but trusting God and listening because he imparts that wisdom into us. Acts chapter 10 starts off with Peter on the top of the roof. Roof, roof, whatever you say. And he's praying. It's the middle of the day. He's really good and faithful. He does the noonday prayers. And he's up there praying and all of a sudden the sheet comes down from heaven and it's got all kinds of food that dietarily they're not supposed to eat. The Jewish people aren't supposed to eat. And God tells him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Peter says, uh-uh, uh-uh, can't do that. Goes up. A little bit later, it comes down again. Peter, get up. Kill and eat. No, God, I can't. It's unpure. The third time, Peter again is holding firm. No, 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 I'm not going to do it. And then God's voice says, Don't call anything unpure that I've made or created. In the meantime, Cornelius, who is a great person, a great Gentile, a good God-fearer who loves the Lord, sees a vision of an angel, and he says, go get Peter and bring him, have him come back to your house. Now there's two parts of this. The servants leave the next day and they go and they find Peter, and Peter invites them into his house, which is against Jewish custom. 
It would defile his house. It would make it unclean. But Peter goes down and the Lord says, Go down. There's three people looking for you. He goes down and he opens the door. And he invites them in to eat and to stay overnight. And the next day they start the journey. It's not the same day. It's the next day that they start the journey. And they go back. And they arrive at Cornelius' house. Listen to what Peter says. Because Peter wants them to understand what he's doing. And how much God loves them. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. And he said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? And Cornelius explains the vision that he had three days ago. And that he'd heard from God and God answered his prayer. And then Peter starts unfolding the gospel. He starts sharing the word about what Jesus did for them, about why He came. And that He came for the whole world, not just for one group, but for the whole world. And then we read here, he says, While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles for they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. This is the power of God when we share His Word. If we're His friend, we go out and we share His Word. We would share what He's done for us and the Holy Spirit will come down. He will use you and speak those words so it may touch the hearts of those who are ready to receive His Word. For those who haven't heard His Word. For those who seek God. That's how important you are to Him. Today the question is, are you a friend of Jesus? Or are you an acquaintance of Jesus? We can come, we can sit, we can hear. But are you a friend of Jesus? Some of you have probably heard the song... What a friend we have in Jesus. I love the second verse of that. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful? Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Today we experience God's love through His Son Jesus. But we also see something else. That if we are truly His disciples, that we're truly His friends, He no longer calls us servants. Not that we're acquaintances, but that we are His true friends who place our trust in Him who is faithful, who shares all our pains and sorrows, who comforts us, who rejoices with us when we experience that joy. Are you a friend of Jesus today? Or are you an acquaintance? If you are a friend with Jesus, go share the good news with someone. Just as Peter shared it with Cornelius, it doesn't matter who they are. Share the good news. Not with condemnation, but with love. But if you're an acquaintance with Jesus, will you open up your heart just as those Gentiles did and receive what He's got for you that you may experience the true grace, love, and mercy Not counting on yourself or some other religion or philosophy or anything, but counting on the one true and living God. Will you give your heart to Him today? Will you let Him be the Lord of your life? Will you allow the Holy Spirit to enter into you? Will you give Him that joy? 
friend or acquaintance. Amen.